In this set of notes, we're going to look at the fundamental theorem of cal calculus. So to start out with here, we are going to state the fundamental theorem. And so the fundamental theorem says, if f is continuous on the closed interval from a to b, then the function f defined by the following. So here we have capital F of x is equal to the integral from a to x f u d u, where x lies between a and b is continuous on the closed interval a and b and differential, differentiable on a, b with the derivative of f of x equal to little f of x. So let's kind of break down what's actually going on here in this definition. So if you'll recall, we talked about how integration looks at the area under the curve or under a curve. And so the idea here is if I were to draw a graph and let's say I had the closed interval from A to B. And let's say in that interval I had some kind of function. What capital F of X does is it's really, we see a function of X here and X is up here. So what this um, uh, integral is actually doing is it's not looking at the area under the curve from A to B. It's saying if we have an x somewhere in between a and b, the integral is equal to this area. And so notice by having this be a function of x and x be at the top of the integral, what we're allowing is we're allowing to define this as x moves between a and b. And so in other words, based on the value of x, the area is going to change. So therefore the area or the integral is a function of x. And so we use x here to denote how much we're moving along the x-axis. And so when we define the function, and so notice the function piece, this piece right here is actually defining the curve. And so we don't want to put x in here again because then we would have x both defining the curve and where we are along the x-axis. So typically, we're, you're going to see a different letter in there when we have x you know, in, at the top of the integral where x is defining where we are along the x-axis. Now, the two most common ways that I see this written are with f u d u, and then I'll also see this written as a to x f of t dt. And I've noticed that your textbook uses both of these. It doesn't really matter which one you choose, but the important thing here is if we have a t inside the function, we have dt, and if we have a u inside the function, we have du. Your book, there's actually a misprint in your book. So when you read this section in your book where they're introducing this idea of the fundamental theorem of calculus and they're giving you some background, you'll notice um, in line 6.6 .6 and 6.7, there's two places where they say f of t du. And I believe that that is a typo there. Um, they either need to have f, t, f of t dt or f of u du, but you don't want to mix the two. And again, the reason we're doing this is because capital F is a function of X and the X that is changing is our position along the, the X axis. No matter where we are along the X axis, we're still evaluating the same curve up top. And so notice if we were allow, if we had X again inside of the function instead of a U, what that would suggest is that we might have different curve. So that, that's why we want to be very careful with how we write that. Now, you should notice that this looks very similar to what you have seen before. And so, looking at this, let's look at a couple examples that we could immediately solve just by applying this theorem. And so, what we're going to focus on is finding the derivative of y with respect to x, and we have a couple different y's defined here. So, let's look at our first one we're first going to note that the function f of x equal to 4 minus x squared divided by 2 is continuous. So notice that function is coming from right here. 
Now here, inside of the integral, we've defined it with a t, again, for the reason that I set up above. But if we're just defining the function f of x, then we're perfectly fine to go ahead and define it using x. I could also define it using t here. It doesn't actually matter because the x is really just a dummy variable. But using the x here is going to make um, applying the fundamental theorem of calculus a little bit easier here in just a second. And so notice again that that function is continuous everywhere. So if we were to set f of x to be equal to this integral from 0 to x, 4 minus t squared divided by 2 dt, notice that we have the following. The thing that we want to find up here at the very beginning is the derivative of y with respect to x. But notice y is equal to this entire integral. So this is going to be equal to the derivative with respect to x of f of x. And that's because we've defined capital F of x to be equal to that integral. So the only thing that I'm doing here is notice I'm not actually doing any calculations, I'm just doing substitution. And the reason for that is, is we have that both y and f of x are equal to the same thing. So all I'm doing there is substituting in f of x for y. But notice again that this is equal to that integral. And again, this is how we've defined things. So again, no calculations. I'm just doing a substitution. But notice by the fundamental theorem of calcula calculus that the derivative with respect of f of x is equal to little f of x in this context. And a little f of x is equal to 4 minus x squared divided by 2. And so again, this example is more about looking at the notation and how things are related in context of the fundamental um, theorem of calculus. We're not actually doing any calculations in this problem. We're really just looking at the different notation, the different pieces that are equal to one another, and applying that fundamental theorem. So let's look at one more example where we do this. So again, we're first going to note that here f of x is equal to x e to the minus t squared. And that's coming from right here. And we note that it is continuous for all x. So if we set f of x, and this is capital F of x, to be equal to the integral from 1 to x, t e to the negative t squared dt, then we have the following. The derivative of y with respect to x is equal to the derivative with respect to x of capital F of x, which is equal to the derivative with respect to x of the integral. But that is equal to f of x, which is equal to x e to the negative x squared. So essentially what this is showing is that differentiation can reverse integration and vice versa. And so this should start to look very similar to what we did with the antiderivative back in section 5.10. So the next section in your book looks at Leibniz rule and gives a rigorous proof of the fundamental theorem of calculus. I'm not going to cover that here, but I do highly recommend um, have a read through that and look through that section. So the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus tells us this piece right here. So then that also tells us that the derivative of capital F of X is equal to little f of X. And that's what we just showed in those examples, because notice in each of these, we're taking the derivative of capital F of X, and we end up with little f of X, provided that F of X is continuous over the range of integration. And so that's why we always want to say for each of those that, that function is continuous. 
ends up that this is the exact same thing as saying that capital F of X is the antiderivative of little f of x. And so again, remember that we looked at that in section 5.10. So this idea of the antiderivative leads us to the definition of what's called an indefinite integral. And so here is the definition. So let's look at a couple different pieces here to see what we have. So the first thing to notice here is that what we are going to end up with is the same as the general antiderivative. So we could use that notation that we used previously for the general antiderivative, or we could use this notation. We're going to end up with the exact same thing. Also, when we define the general antiderivative, we typically are going to use x in the func function. And again, this is because we do have a function of x here. Now, on the right-hand side of the equation, just like we saw before, since x appears at the top of the integral, we are going to use a dummy variable inside, and so you'll typically either see u or you'll see t here. And then the last part. You'll notice here in this piece we go from a to x it ends up that the starting point is not important because different starting points are only going to differ by this constant c. So if you were to vary where a was, you would just add on or subtract from c. It would still be the difference of a constant. And so for right now, we don't actually worry about the value of a. So let's compute an indefinite integral and see what this is going to look like. So the first thing we need to do is we need to find a function, capital F of x, such that the derivative of f of x is equal to x to the 10th. Now, we saw problems like this when we worked with the antiderivatives. And so remember that when we worked with the antiderivative, we were essentially trying to work backwards. And we're going to do the exact same thing here. So the solution is the following. The indefinite integral of x to the 10th dx is equal to 1 over 11 x to the 11th plus c. And so notice this piece right here, that's that antiderivative that we saw back in section 5.10. And here c is a constant. And just like with the antiderivatives, we always want to check things. So let's take the derivative of 1 over 11 x to the 11th plus c. Notice this is going to be equal to 11 over 11 x to the 10th by the power rule plus 0, which is equal to x to the 10th, which is exactly what we had up top. And so that checks out. So if you'll recall, um, back in section 5.10, and there was this was in your textbook, but it was also on page 5 of the notes, you had a very similar table that looked at different antiderivatives. And if you look at some of these, I'm going to mark the ones. These are all just using a different style of notation, but they're exactly the same as what was on that table in 5.10. The only difference is the style of notation. Instead of using that antiderivative notation, here we're using the integral notation. 
but it means the exact same thing. And so there's some couple extra ones here. And then there's two that they've also excluded. Um, but again, we could show that this is true by using the antiderivatives. Uh, the first one they've excluded here is where we can pull a constant out from the antiderivative. We can do that with integrals. And then also there was one with summations. Whenever we had sums, we could break the antiderivative up in sums. We can do the same thing for integrals. And so we're going to compute a couple different um, indefinite integrals and you're going to see this process is going to look almost just like when we computed the antiderivatives. So here we've got the indefinite integral from x cubed minus 4 dx. Well just like we can split up sums with antiderivatives we can do the same thing with integrals. So this is equal to the integral of x cubed dx minus the integral of 4 dx And so for the first term that we have here, we're kind of doing a reverse power rule. I know that the derivative of 4 to the x is going to give me an x to the third, but I don't want to have a 4 out front. I want a 3, so I'm going to multiply this by 1 fourth. And then the next term is going to be minus 4x, and then we have plus c. Looking at another example here. For a lot of the examples that you work with, um, sometimes how you'll want to start out is just rewriting that integral into a form that you can work with or that looks familiar um, using some of these rules from either this table or that antiderivative table. And so the first thing that I'm going to do here, I'm going to start out by writing my indefinite integral. Now looking at this, you know, it looks kind of complex to deal with this fraction and I note that I've only got a single term in the denominator and I've got two terms in the numerator. So the first thing I'm going to do is split this into two fractions. So at first I'm really not going to do anything with the integral. I'm just going to split the fraction. And then the next thing I'm going to do is I can actually, since I've got an x to the one half in the denominator for each of these, I can kind of combine that with the numerator and this is going to be equal to the following. And now I'm going to use that rule with the summations and pulling out constants. So this is going to be equal to one half times the integral from x to the 5 halves plus, oops, and there's a dx there, plus 3 halves times the integral x to the 3 halves dx. And then again, just like in section 5.10, when I was thinking in terms of the antiderivative, what I'm trying to do here is apply these rules, and really what I'm doing is I'm working backwards. So for each of these, I'm asking myself, okay, what what is going to give me a derivative that's equal to 5 divided by 2 and what is going to give me a derivative that is equal to th x to the 3 divided by 2. And so again it's kind of that reverse power rule. And so here we're going to end up with the following. Again, other than notation, almost exactly what we did in section 5.10. All right, and so here is one more example. So again, the first thing I'm going to do is to get this in a form that's a little bit easier to work with. And so I'll first note that this is equal to x minus 1 times x minus 1 dx, but that's equal to the integral of x squared minus 2x plus 1 dx. I'm going to break this up by the sums, so I'm going to have this is equal to the integral of x squared dx minus the integral of 2x dx plus the integral of 1 dx. 
Now when I go through here again, I'm thinking of kind of that reverse power rule. And I get the following. And you might look at this just like with the antiderivatives, and you might say, well, shouldn't each of these have a C with it? And they do, but remember, we don't really care about the actual value that C takes. We just care that it is some constant. So even if I have a C with each of them, that turns into 3C, and we generally just write that as C because, again, it's just a constant. We don't really care what the value of the constant is. And that's because we're writing this, again, kind of in that general form, just like we did with the general antiderivatives. And so this is equal to 1 third x to the third minus x squared plus x plus c. And then let's just do one more here. So again, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to pull my constant out of my integral. And then again, I'm thinking of working backwards. I know I need something so that when I take the derivative of it, it's going to give me a 3x. Well, we know the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. So the derivative of 3, or probably e to the 3x, well, we're going to have to apply the chain rule, but I do know I'm going to have an e to the 3x. But when I were to take the derivative of e to the 3x, I would also multiply by 3 by the chain rule. And so here, what I want to have is a 1 third plus c. And again, this is so that when I take the derivative of e to the 3x and multiply by 3, I just end up with e to the 3x. Exact same thing we did with those antiderivatives back in section 5.10. So the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus, what it does is it helps us calculate indefinite integrals. The second part of the fundamental theorem of calculus helps us to compute definite integrals. So in other words, the indefinite integrals, just like the general antiderivative, they all include that C. So we only get it up to a family of functions. Whereas in a definite integral, we're not going to have the C, we're actually going to have the value very similar to the initial value problems when we worked with the antiderivatives in chapter 5.10. Alright, so again, for example, if we look at that example that we just had up above, notice we do have that C in the solution. But we may want to evaluate a definite integral, and so a definite integral could go from 2 to 5. And we saw some definite integrals in the previous section, and we're going to see how the fundamental theorem of calculus can actually help us with that. So the second part of the fundamental theorem of calculus tells us the following. If we want to evaluate an integral from A to B, what we can do is take the indefinite integral from B minus the indefinite integral from A. So why does this work? So again, let's think of a graph where we have an inter interval from A to B. And so what is happening here is if we were to look at the area under the curve, if we take the interval part of the integral evaluated at B, the indefinite one, that would give us all of the area back. Evaluated at A would give us all of the area back from A, and if we subtract f of B from f of A, we're left with the middle, which is the area between A and B, which is exactly what we want. So here, f of x is any antiderivative of f of x, and f, capital F prime of x is equal to f of x. So here, the reason that any antiderivative works, and we're going to see this here in a minute, is remember that all of the antiderivatives have that constant. And so in each of these, what we're going to end up with is a plus C and a plus C, and they're going to cancel out. And your book gives a pretty detailed discussion of all of this. I'm just kind of giving an overview with these. So again, as always, do make sure that you read through that more thorough discussion that's in your textbook. 
All right, so we are going to evaluate the definite integral from 0 to 3 of 2x squared minus 1 dx. So the first thing that we are going to note is that that function 2x squared minus 1 is continuous on the interval from 0 to 3. And again, we're interested in the interval from 0 to 3. So next, we need the antiderivative of 2x squared minus 1. And so notice the antiderivative here is going to be equal to 2 thirds x cubed minus x plus c. And again, that's just like all the other examples we've seen. We're basically reply, applying the reverse of the power law or the power rule. So next, what we're going to do is we are going to evaluate at the two different values. So first, let's evaluate at f of 0, so the lower end point. The lower end point, we're going to have 2 thirds times 0 cubed minus 0 plus c. So that will just be equal to c. At the upper end point, we're going to have f of 3, which is equal to 2 thirds times 3 cubed minus 3 plus c. And this is going to be equal to 15 plus c. So now to evaluate the definite integral from 0 to 3, 2x squared minus 1 dx, this is going to be equal to f of 3 minus f of 0, which is equal to 15 plus c minus c. So see how those constants are canceling out, which is just equal to 15. So therefore, the definite integral from 0 to 3, 2x squared minus 1 dx is equal to 15. All right, so this next example, I actually meant to remove this from the notes, so you'll see that removed from your copy. But let's do one more example here. So here we're going to evaluate the definite integral from 0 to 2 of 2t e to the t squared dx. Oh, and sorry, that should be a dt there. I will also fix that in your copy. So first, we're going to note that 2t e to the t squared is continuous on the interval from 0 to 2. So just like the previous example, we need the antiderivative of 2 to the t e to the t squared. And so we need to try to think about how we could think of reversing this process. Now typically, when we're working with e to the anything, that's always a good place to start. Because you know that if you take the derivative of e to the anything, that value is going to end up in the derivative. So we could start with thinking of e to the t squared. Now the next step is we didn't generally want to look at e to the t squared and think, okay, what is the derivative of e to the t squared? And then we can see how we need to manipulate that derivative to get the quantity that we have. So notice the derivative of e to the t squared is e to the t squared, but then by the chain rule, we need to multiply by the derivative of t squared which is just equal to 2t. And notice in this case, we actually get exactly what it was that we needed, so we don't even need to do any other manipulation. So in this case, our antiderivative is equal to e to the t squared plus c. So again, we're going to evaluate at the lower and upper point. So f of 0 in this case is equal to e to the 0 squared plus c, which is equal to 1 plus c. f to the 2 is equal to e 
to the 2 squared plus c, which is equal to e to the 4th plus c. And again, c is a constant. So to evaluate that definite integral that we want, we've got the integral from 0 to 2 of 2t e to the t squared dt is equal to f of 2 minus f of 0, which is equal to e to the 4th plus c minus 1 plus c, which is just equal to e to the 4th minus 1. And so again, notice those c's cancel, and the c's are always going to cancel in problems like this. So you will often see the c's left off, and that's the reason is because they're always going to cancel. Now, another form of notation that is very common, and I just I want to show you all so you've at least seen it, is if we're evaluating the integral from 0 to 2, 2 to the t, e to the t squared dt, and you'll see this notation more later on, but notice that the antiderivative piece is e to the t squared. Often what we'll write is the antiderivative, and then we'll say we're going to evaluate it, so that's a vertical bar, from 0 to 2. And so this is equal to e to the 2 squared minus e to the 0 squared, which is equal to e to the 4th minus 1, so we get the exact same thing. And so this notation, um, once you get to where you're doing a lot of integrals, um, this notation is the most commonly used. So as always, if you have any questions, you want me to look at anything, please let me know.